Hi. In the first part of Royal Resilience, I explored the psychological impact of Henry VIII on his eldest daughter, Mary. Today, I'm going to consider Elizabeth and how her complex relationship with her father and his treatment of her and her mother shaped her life and reign. Thank you again to Pamela for asking, how do you think Henry VIII's daughters were impacted psychologically by his treatment of them? It's a great question. Elizabeth I was born on the 7th of September, 1533 and was Henry VIII's daughter by his second wife, Anne Boleyn. Her mother had been pregnant with Elizabeth when Henry married her officially in January 1533, and Anne had been heavily pregnant at her coronation on the 1st of June 1533. Royal astrologers had predicted that Anne was carrying a prince, the Prince of Wales that Henry VIII was so desperate to have. So there was understandably disappointment at her birth, but she was healthy and her birth showed that Anne Boleyn could carry a baby to term. So there was hope for the future. Within just months of her birth, Elizabeth was set up in her own royal household away from court. And in 1534, her elder half-sister Mary, who'd been demoted from princess to lady and had her royal household dismantled, joined her. Mary was shocked and furious but there's no evidence that she took any of her ill feeling out on little Elizabeth. It must, however, have been hard for Mary to see Elizabeth, the daughter of the woman who'd usurped Mary's mother's place, become the apple of her father's eye and to steal her place in the succession. Elizabeth's time in the spotlight was cut short, however, by her mother's fall and subsequent execution in May 1536. Elizabeth, who was two years and eight months when her mother was beheaded, was away from court at the time and was used to not seeing her mother regularly. What was she told and when? We just don't know. Did she notice anything was wrong or different? Again, we don't know. But Lady Bryan, who was in charge of her nursery, did have to write to the king, pointing out that Elizabeth was short of clothes. And a three-year-old Elizabeth apparently asked Sir John Shelton, head of her household, How haps it, Governor, yesterday my Lady Princess, and today but my Lady Elizabeth? Although I've been unable to find that quote in the contemporary sources so far. Two months after Anne Boleyn's execution, when Mary had just submitted to her father and been reconciled with him, Mary wrote to her father, My sister Elizabeth is well, and such a child toward as I doubt not but your highness shall have cause to rejoice of in time coming. It's lovely to hear such kind words from Mary about the little girl who'd stolen her place. But Elizabeth had now been demoted, and Mary knew what that was like. Just days after her mother's execution, Elizabeth's father, Henry VIII, married Jane Seymour. And in October 1537, Jane gave birth to a son, the future Edward VI. Both Mary and Elizabeth attended Edward's christening with Mary standing as godmother and Elizabeth bearing the chrism cloth. Edward's birth saw Elizabeth losing Lady Bryan, which must have been a wrench for the little girl but Lady Bryan was replaced with Catherine Champanam, who would marry Sir John Astley or Ashley and be known to us as Cat Astley. Although following Elizabeth's mother's execution, Henry VIII had little time for his younger daughter, David Starkey points out that he kept abreast of her education and progress through reports. It wasn't until after the king's marriage to his sixth wife, Catherine Parr, however, that Elizabeth was properly rehabilitated and spent more time at court. Catherine brought the Tudor family together and had good relationships with all three of her stepchildren, being friends with Mary and concerning herself with the education and upbringing of Elizabeth and Edward. By this point, Elizabeth had lost Jane Seymour, who she'd hardly have known, seen Anne of Cleves set aside and heard of her third stepmother, Catherine Howard's execution. It's hard to know what she thought of all that. But apparently, after Catherine's fall, eight-year-old Elizabeth vowed to her friend Robert Dudley that she'd never marry. Who could blame her? She'd seen her father's track record. I think the years 1543 to the end of 1546 were good ones for Elizabeth. She was back to being close to her father. 
David Starkey writes of these years, she had a place in the succession at court and increasingly in her father's affections. She rejoiced in them all, especially the last, which is why her memory of her father, formed in these few years of the mid-1540s, was so benign. For her, he was not a wife-murdering monster, but a loving parent, formidable ruler, a model to which she aspired. And in 1546, Elizabeth wrote of her father being her matchless and most benevolent father and went on to say that she was not only an imitator of his virtues, but indeed an inheritor of them. And Elizabeth had a kind and loving stepmother in Catherine Parr, a woman who must have been such a role model to the precocious and intelligent Elizabeth at a key time in her life. Elizabeth was also close to her siblings. Unfortunately, things would change with Henry VIII's death in January 1547. It was Edward's uncle, Edward Seymour, Earl of Hertford, who informed Edward and Elizabeth of their father's death. The two children were grief-stricken. As David Starkey notes, Elizabeth had, did she but know it, much to weep about, for she was to know no real peace until 15 years later she wore her father's crown. So while Henry VIII was alive, Elizabeth, like Mary, had gone from pampered princess to neglected illegitimate daughter and back again, although never being given her status back. It was quite a roller coaster ride. But Elizabeth was not treated cruelly, and I'm not sure how aware of things she would have been, being so much younger than Mary. She did, however, have to live with the fact that her mother had been brutally executed. But I think it was the experiences between 1547 and 1558 that really shaped the woman and Queen Elizabeth would become. Elizabeth must have been thrilled when she learned that she was going to be taken into her stepmother Catherine Parr's household following her father's death. The two were like mother and daughter. However, she was to be badly let down by Catherine. Not long after Henry VIII's death, Catherine married Thomas Seymour brother of Lord Protector Edward Seymour and Edward VI's uncle. He may have married Catherine, but he showed a very unhealthy interest in the teenaged Elizabeth. He had a key to the girl's bedchamber and would let himself in early in the morning before Elizabeth was dressed. Dressed only in his shirt, the Tudor equivalent of underwear for men, and nothing under his shirt, he would bid her good morning and strike her on the back or buttocks familiarly. And Elizabeth would just be in her smock. Elizabeth started getting up earlier and earlier so that she'd be dressed before his arrival, and she'd try and hide behind her ladies, but it didn't help. He even came in with his wife one time, and they both tickled Elizabeth. And on one occasion in the garden, Catherine Parr restrained Elizabeth while Seymour slashed the girl's gown into a hundred pieces. This was grooming and abuse. It cannot be seen otherwise. Catherine eventually acted, sending Elizabeth away from the household and into the care of Sir Anthony Denny and his wife. But the damage to Elizabeth's reputation was done. Elizabeth also had to cope with being separated from Catherine, the woman she loved, and then the grief caused by Catherine's death after childbirth in September 1548. Then Thomas Seymour dramatically fell from grace, nearly bringing Elizabeth down with him, for he was accused, amongst other things, of planning to marry Elizabeth without the king's permission. It was even rumoured that Elizabeth had had Seymour's child. Elizabeth was interrogated, her lady Cat Astley and her cofferer Thomas Parry were arrested and thrown in the tower and interrogated. And Thomas Seymour was executed for high treason. It must have been a scary time for Elizabeth, but fortunately her servants corroborated her story, although the details of Seymour's morning visits came out, something that must have been humiliating for her. Elizabeth's reputation was damaged, but she'd survived. Elizabeth managed to keep good relations with her siblings. While Mary and Edward fell out over religion, Elizabeth managed to get on with both of them. And she must have been truly saddened when her brother died at just 15 years of age in July 1553. 
Elizabeth appears to have stayed out of the events surrounding the succession crisis of July 1553, when Mary proclaimed herself Queen and removed Queen Jane or Lady Jane Grey. But her half-brother removing her from the succession and deeming her half-blood and incapable of inheriting the throne must have been quite hard to bear. Once Mary had been officially proclaimed Queen, Elizabeth wrote to her, sending her congratulations, and the two of them rode into the City of London together the two daughters of Henry VIII. Mary set about restoring Catholicism in England and reconciling with Rome. And although Elizabeth was definitely of the Reformed faith, she kept her faith to herself and chose to stay away from court as much as possible. Elizabeth may have wanted a quiet life, perhaps, but others had different ideas. And Wyatt's rebellion of early 1554 brought trouble to Elizabeth. This was a rebellion against Mary's decision to marry the powerful Philip of Spain, son of Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor. First, Mary had restored the Catholic faith and now she was going to make England one of Philip of Spain's territories. Wyatt and his rebels, who included Henry Grey, Duke of Suffolk, father of the imprisoned Lady Jane Grey, sought to depose Mary and replace her with Elizabeth. The rebellion failed and the rebels were apprehended and imprisoned. And then Elizabeth was escorted to the Tower of London too. Mary's government was convinced that Elizabeth must have known about the rebellion, that she'd been involved. But once again, Elizabeth kept her cool. Wyatt and his fellow rebels were executed and Lady Jane Grey and her husband were executed too. So Elizabeth must have lived in real fear of losing her head. She was interrogated several times, but no evidence could be found against her and Wyatt had claimed she was innocent. After spending two months in the tower, Elizabeth was released on the anniversary of her mother's execution, the 19th of May, 1554. But it wasn't freedom. She was being released into house arrest, and Elizabeth feared that she'd be assassinated while on her way to house arrest at Woodstock, as that would be perfect for Mary. It would get Elizabeth out of the way. Elizabeth was kept at Woodstock until April 1555, when she was summoned to court to attend on Mary, who was believed to be pregnant. While she was there, the two women were able to reconcile, and Elizabeth was at Mary's side while she came to terms with the fact that she wasn't really pregnant. In October 1555, Elizabeth was finally given permission to leave court to go to her own estate at Hatfield. She was now a free woman. Elizabeth was able to stay out of trouble for the rest of Mary's reign, but over a year of living under the shadow of the axe must have had a real impact on her. It's hard to know how she felt when she received the news of Mary's death in 1558. Sadness, relief, a mixture of both. But she's said to have quoted in Latin from Psalm 118, a verse which translates to, This is the Lord's doing, it is marvellous in our eyes. Elizabeth had been through so much in her 25 years, but she was queen now. Elizabeth may have had a complex relationship with her father, but as I said, the time she spent with him in the 1540s, when they were reconciled, stayed with her, and she called on his memory on several occasions. For example, when she said, Although I may not be a lioness, I am a lion's cub and inherit many of his qualities. And she drew on her mother's memory too on many occasions, for example, making use of her mother's falcon badge. It's impossible to know how Elizabeth felt about her father's role in her mother's execution and the blackening of Anne Boleyn's reputation and how Elizabeth reconciled herself to it. She had Boleyn relatives in her household who could have told her about her mother and what happened in 1536, but she never seems to have spoken ill of her father. I think Elizabeth's experiences as a teenager and young, young woman had far more effect on her psychologically than her mother's execution, for she appears to have been protected from that, being so young and away from court. Seymour's grooming, her separation from Catherine Parr and then Catherine's death, Seymour's fall and the scandals surrounding Elizabeth then, and her time spent in prison and in house arrest in Mary's reign must surely have affected her more. Perhaps her decision to stay single was impacted by her father's marital history, 
but probably had more to do with her sister's marriage to Philip of Spain and the effect that that had on the kingdom. But I think her strength and resilience came from what she went through. Elizabeth, the daughter of a woman who was seen as a whore and traitor by many, reigned from 1558 to 1603. She's gone down in history as one of the greatest monarchs England has ever seen, as Gloriana the Virgin Queen. And that is a testament to her strength, courage, resilience, and probably a healthy dose of pragmatism. What do you think? I'd love to hear your thoughts.